Hello everyone and welcome to Imperator Rome. I'm Lord Forrent here with another guide. This one is the Tribal Nation Guide. So I did one on the Tribal Economy a while back, so go watch that one if you want to know how to build economy. We'll briefly touch on that here. Suffice to say, a lot of it has to do with trade routes and general, um, generally produce more goods and trade them. So, Tribal Nations. Let's just start off right off the bat and say tribal nations kind of suck right now. Um, if Paradox sees this, tribes need to rework sooner rather than later. Even some touch-up would be nice. Um, there's not a lot of unique events for tribes beyond um, interacting with your tribal, um, tribal chiefs. And there's only a handful of nations that actually have um, unique heritage um, in the tribal world, which really that should change. Um, there should also be bloodlines, but let's get into what actually exists. So as a tribal nation, you have a tribal chief and you usually have clan chiefs. The clan chiefs um, depend on how big your country is. In this case, we're a small nation, so we have three. Think of the clan chiefs as your noble families and it's just the head of the family has actual like troops. Um, tribal nations have a unique mechanic that civilized nations don't have called centralization. It can be positive, it can be negative. There are benefits to both and different play styles. Um, you have some different interactions. You can assemble raiding parties, which is nice if you want to collect a lot of slaves. And you can encourage tribal migration um, if you want to also lower your centralization. Uh, tribal chiefs as I said, are the heads of your uh, important families in republics or monarchies. However, they when you raise the levies, they have command of their troops, which makes them slightly more dangerous than your average um, leading family because they will win prestige and glory because they'll be commanding the troops while at war. Thankfully, your ruler also has a levy of their own and they will be commanding it. And uh, more, if you have more clan chiefs, you get more retinues to command. The number is not significant. I think this whole system needs a bit of a rework. It kind of feels tacked on to the existing tribal mechanics. You have roughly the standard government posts um, up there. You don't have anything for like mercenary maintenance or army stuff. Instead, you get morale rec uh, manpower recovery. And your elder contributes to tribesmen happiness, which you're going to have the vast majority of your population are going to be tribesmen. Thankfully, tribesmen are pretty productive for their um, for their government type, but they are not they're not the best because they don't really contribute to research at all. And the rest of this is all pretty standard. Now, in terms of laws, you have a choice. You can become centralized here on the right side tree, or you can become decentralized on the left tree. If you're going to be decentralized, you're going to becoming a you're going to basically becoming a roving warband. <laughs> Literally, it's called roving warbands. Uh, basically, think Mongol um, horse nomad archer type things from the east is the easiest one to understand, or nations like the Huns, the Mongols any of the uh, horse archer nations are going to be pretty similar to what you would think of a uh, decentralized nation. You can still do it as a Western tribe. Um, it's just they didn't have it as much. So we'll start down the decentralization and then we'll go down centralization because centralization leads to becoming a civilized nation, which you are not. So up top, you have your religious integration. Thankfully, um, you start out with some base advantages in every category, um, some of which are more helpful than others. Uh, religious freedom makes your tribesmen happier, which is always a good one. Uh, even if you go down the centralized tree, you do keep that benefit, which will help you when you civilize. However, it has two other ones. Uh, as you can see, it has no penalty towards centralization, but if you go further down, the other choices here encourage syncretism, uh, gives you unintegrated cultural group happiness at the cost of some centralization, and then adopt human sacrifices gives you omen power at the cost of a lot of centralization a month. 
I actually encouraged everybody who, whether you're going centralized or decentralized, to swap to encouraging syncretism pretty much immediately, maybe as your third law if you're changing and you're going centralized, just so you don't go, you don't lose centralization, go negative. The unintegrated culture group happiness plus 12% is is amazing. It's uh, it's better than what you can get through innovations and in technology. Um, it's it's just amazing. It means you can hold cult, um, hold population from other cultures without a huge amount of penalties. Obviously, they'll still be unhappy, but the base twelve plus happiness is is ridiculous. It's it's amazing, and it's definitely one of the best things tribes get. Further down, you've got the choices for kinship, property ownership, tribesman output, or tax. Uh, rule of thumb: the output usually tends to be more useful if you want manpower and money. The tax is going to be more useful if you just want money, but less manpower. Also, you got to think of how much centralization it takes away each month uh, if you want to go decentralized, because you usually want to try and pick the highest one. So if you do this one and get 0.05, you probably want to do common good just so that you lose centralization faster. Chiefly status, you start with insular clans, has no benefit, which is a little odd. Um, they should almost, in my opinion, every law should have some benefit or negative. Local dynasties plus stability, which can be very useful if you're conquering things um, or just a lot uh, constantly at war, keep your nation much more stable. Power to the mighty, loyalty of clan chiefs, again, can be useful the larger you get, the more tribesmen and the more your uh, tribal chiefs will get ambitious and can start civil wars and stuff. Uh, out of the two, uh, probably go local dynasties early while you're growing and then flip, flip to clan chiefs once they start causing trouble. 10% loyalty is really good, especially if you manage to get any other tech, which if you're going down decentralized, you're probably almost never going to get tech. Uh, it's going to be super hard. Then uh, hospitality, you get pop assimilation speed or integrated culture happiness. I would take the oral tradition here, pop assimilation speed, just so that you can convert people to your culture much quicker. Um, Integrated culture happiness is very useful if you're um, basically integrating populations, but uh, if you're also doing unintegrated culture group happiness from up here, uh, you shouldn't need to integrate as much as normal because they won't be as angry as normal. Further down, we got war philosophy. Interestingly, you start with the roving war bands and you keep it even if you go centralized. But you also have the option of slave output and slave inefficiency. If you want to build a slave economy, lots of raiding, conquering, um, production of trade goods and tax, this is what you want to take. And if you're ever having trouble fighting larger nations or your levies are causing you too much war exhaustion, honor in battle will get you morale and war exhaustion. Out of the two, if you want an economy, take rightful dominion. If you want to fight larger nations like Rome or Carthage, do honor and battle. Up here, we've got the centralized laws. They're a little bit more straightforward than the decentralized ones. They basically give you a bonus towards centralization and something else. And the centralization ones are probably worse overall than the decentralized ones, but that's because you don't stay centralized for long. You want to become a civilized nation. So you got your economic system, barter economy or coin minting. Out of the two of them, uh, barter economy is going to help you more in the long run because the plus 20 commerce income is huge. Um, as I said, your economy is going to be based mainly off trade. So this will give you 20% more income, which as a tribal nation, it's hard to make money and that will help. Civilization change, not particularly useful because tribes have a low cap for a long time and uh, your civilization will mainly grow in your cities to start until you reform. And then code of rule, you can have a council legal authority, which reduces tyranny or absolute authority, which gives you ruler popularity. I would almost always go with the absolute authority, get the ruler monthly popularity game rather, rather than the council legal authority. Um, you could take council legal authority if you want to reform to a republic, but by and large, tyranny is tyranny is the least uh, problematic of all the stats in the game because you can usually you have to choose to increase tyranny. It doesn't increase randomly usually. 
And then we get to an important one down here, infrastructure tenants. You start off with the nomadic lifestyle penalty, which makes founding cities 50% more expensive. This means in order to found a city, you have to pay a lot. 310 gold and 77.5 political influence. Obviously that's much higher than normal, um, which means you probably only want maybe one city prior to get changing that law because otherwise you're gonna, it's gonna be super expensive. You're not gonna get much. So you wanna change away from that as soon as you can, which requires 50 centralization or 30 centralization. Uh, formalized agriculture reduces the slaves needed for a surplus trade good. Not particularly useful in my opinion because trying to get surpluses is already hard enough. Hill fort, which gives overall tribal tribesmen output much more useful, especially since it's going to be like 80 to 90% of your population are tribesmen. Uh, bureaucratic system. You've got tribal representatives, monthly political influence up, or versus sedentary bureaucracy. So think of it this way. Tribal representatives is to get you political power that you can then invest in cities, at which point sedentary bureaucracy with the more cities will allow you to promote the population. Obviously, weigh this with how fast you want to centralize or not. Uh, as a rule of thumb, centralizing faster rather than slower is always a better outcome. Um, being a civilized nation, you can do a lot more. Once you get a regional power as a civilized nation, you can get legions, which you cannot get as a tribal nation. Then you got your code of rights here, which again gives you national tribesmen happiness. If you have these two together, that's plus eight tribesmen happiness just at the start of the game. You can see why tribes tend to be relatively stable. Um, tribesmen, if you're a civilized nation, revolt. But if you got both those as a tribal nation, they're happy. Uh, you got a choice between rights of man and rights of birth. Basically, do you want more citizens or freemen? If you're a uh, civilized nation, and or sorry, you're going for a civilized nation as a centralized tribe, you almost definitely want to do rights of birth here to get the additional citizens, which will get you more research points. Um, the downside of tribes is you're almost always going to be, be behind in research for quite a while. So that is the laws. Left is decentralized, right is centralized. The key ones are encourage syncre syncretism, barter economy, um, nomadic lifestyle here, and um, uh, yeah, those are the those are the major ones. The left side makes a lot of sense. Just you can read the descriptions, figure it out. But I tend to go centralized because centralized nations are stronger. So let's look at some of the other things about a tribal nation. First off, tribal nations you start with zero tech, as you can see there's almost 0% increase a month towards a new tech. Uh, the output is ab absolutely pathetic. In this case, we produce no technology. I'm pretty sure if we go forward a month, that may change. Uh, it didn't change much. Um, I was hoping it might go up a little bit, but it didn't seem to. That is because we have virtually nobody here. We have no citizens. Oh, we have one citizen in our entire nation um, here, which produces a absolutely pathetic amount of research. You'll notice there's a negative 50 is tribe penalty. Thankfully, centralization, as we can see up on the government page, gives bonuses to research, civilization level, and pop promotion speed as it gets higher. So obviously, once you get to like 50 or so, it to some degree will offset the penalty from being a tribe. Not completely, but it certainly helps. Um, actually, it's probably more 100 offsets it, at which point you can start catching up if you haven't civilized already. So thankfully, due to the way capitals work, you are going to have some population turn into both nobles and citizens in your capital. Um, if you build other cities, there'll be some that turn into nobles, and obviously if you build a city, you can build academies, get more nobles, etc, etc. Um, it's not going to be a lot. You're probably going to get, if you just stayed with one city with some nobles and some citizens, you might get one tech in the entire game. Uh, it's not worth it. It's very unproductive in terms of research. You, if you want to do research, you got to civilize, basically. Um, as you can see, though, there's quite a few bonuses here towards the happiness of 
the tribal nation, uh, tribesmen. Um, it's quite useful, as you can see. There's quite a few bonuses. We basically get plus 12 just by being a tribal nation and having those two laws I mentioned and having a tribal elder. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, you've got your standard conquest missions usually. Consult council, conquer lands. The problem is I find that the, as you can see, we start over here in my, one of my favorite tribal nations and it's wanting us to conquer stuff over there. Uh, this is another example why tribal nations don't really do well. Sometimes their missions are weird. I've played nations over here and it's given me missions to conquer here, which is virtually impossible. Um, it's very frustrating to have to deal with. That's a, a rework they definitely could use to do. Um, thankfully, you can do summon war council and you can get uh, claims on lands at the cost of loyalty. Um, can be pretty useful. Be aware that these are your tribal leaders, so losing the loyalty really does hurt. In some ways, it's almost easier just to use political power because you don't have a lot to spend political influence on as a tribe. Uh, other than events and stuff. You'll get events like duels to the death, etc. Um, and you've got to manage them. Uh, thankfully, there are a lot of events as tribal nations that can get you money. Almost always you want to take the money because getting an economy rolling as a tribal nation is very difficult. Let's quickly go over the levies here. So I have raised our troops. And you'll see they are, despite being... 3,500 altogether, they're split between the, the clan chiefs, and more annoyingly, you cannot combine these because they are led by different clan chiefs. So you have to deal with having your having three separate armies in one, uh, which does include food management, which can be a pain. There is a way to get them to all work together, and that is click on allow attachments, and then go into each individual army and do attach to one of them. Now whenever I move this guy's levy around, the others will automatically follow. However, the food is an issue. Uh, tribal levies do not have supply um, supply chains usually, so uh, you do have the slight issue that your armies tend to starve. Thankfully, as you get larger, you get more land. Uh, each tribal levy can kind of function on their own. Uh, let's see what else. Um, you've got only two idea slots, or it varies based off if you're a settled tribe or just a normal tribe. In this case, this is a settled tribe. Um, let's see if I can find a non-settled tribe. I might not be able to get the details on them. Um, basically, non-settled tribe has different government. Um, if you complete the government stuff, you get an additional tribesman happiness in this case, which, as I said, you stack it all together. Uh, thankfully, you have the same ideas as everyone else. If you stack it together, your tribesman happiness is really, really, really good. Um, it's 80 happiness right here just from all of that. It's it's very powerful. Um, unfortunately, as you get nobles and citizens, they will be unhappy. If you build cities, your unhappiness increase as well. So I'm um, not going to go into the religion of tribal nations because they're all different. Instead, let's talk about how to turn into a normal civilized nations. So that is done. Well, first off, you can completely decentralize and be a migratory tribe. If you've got negative centralization, you can click this button here under the nation overview and you'll turn into a migratory tribe. Obviously different forms, less centralization. You'll be going for a roving band of conquerors and enslavers, basically. You do investigate tribal reform, you have to have 60 centralization. Thankfully, as you unlock new centralization, that will speed up. You also have to have all your clan chiefs loyal, at which point a new mission will start for you. Anyway, this new mission is one thing that a, a lot of people get stuck on. It adds it to the mission pool. So if you have an already existing mission, you will not see it. You either have to complete or abort the mission you're on which if you abort, it will cost you five stability. And uh, then you can start a mission to reform your government. You, um, you have a choice. The left side of the tree will be a republic choice. The right side will be a monarchy choice. Um, you have to have either loyal clan chiefs and influence. Depending on who you have in power, you can do 
one reforming the other, and then you kind of have to purge and prosecute uh, the other side. So if you're going monarchy, you have to arrest, imprison, or banish uh, the Republicans. And if you're, the Republic, you're going for a republic, you have to get rid of the monarchists. Um, it can easily tear an unprepared tri tribal nation apart because it will split, uh, split your nation between... They'll side one way or the other, and you'll receive massive loyalty penalties from the other side. Thankfully, the solution to counteracting unhappy people in a tribe is, by and large, mercenaries, because they increase the power base of the nation, which means those tribal chiefs and stuff have a lower percent of it, so they're less likely to rebel. Um, when you start the tribal reform, I recommend you have a good amount of money, a good amount of stability, and a good amount of political influence. It'll take a couple years to do, unless you set up everything perfectly. And at the end of which, you will probably... I would recommend you go for the monarchy overall. Republics have issues. Um, monarchies have less, but you have to worry about successors. Um, go for the monarchy, and then you'll be a basic starting out monarchy and you will be able to have the different law sets which obviously this, the, all these will go away all the benefits all the negatives so take advantage of them before uh they you reform like get plenty of citizens promote your populations get your city set up then flip um at which point your oops, at which point your civilization value which is going to be low It'll increase as you get centralized, will increase massively, because then you will have a city. Um, let's find a city, and you'll see what I mean. Cities tend to have a larger civilization value, because as you build buildings in them, it increases the civilization level. Civilization level has benefits towards happiness, supply, output, capacity, at the downside of offending your tribesmen. So once you commit to one path, you've got to stick to it. Um, thankfully there are plenty of ways to do stuff, but overall tribes are much less exciting than your standard civilized nation. But once you become a tribe, you become a normal civilized nation. So let's jump to one of my existing games here. Uh, I think this will do. So this is one of my empires here, same nation. Um, obviously we've progressed about a hundred or so more years into the game. I reformed my nation into a monarchy. So I have uh, an autocratic monarchy and obviously these are the ideas I picked. I could try and switch to one of these assuming I changed the, I met the requirements. Overall, I found the stratocratic monarchy to be the best out of the options. Um, I'm trying to get Greater Iberia, for those who don't know, it's uh, it takes a while. Anyway, my solution was when I became a non-tribal nation, and I'll go into this now because it's worth doing, my ability to expand became much larger. Once I got a legion, that helped a lot. Unfortunately, I could only support a small amount of legion troops. I think I had four initially. So I had to supplement my income mostly using um, tax. As you can see, my capital here has plenty of trade routes, makes lots of money. Um, other nations have trade, other provinces have trade routes, which helps as well. And I went pretty heavily on building cities in the capital region to try and centralize as much of the civilization and get the benefits from provincial improvements and best provincial investments, and then I've been trying to stick at least one city in every province after that. But how did I get this big this quickly to the point that I easily smashed Carthage and caused, in some ways, the Roman Revolt by humiliating them? Um, diplomacy. I did it through diplomacy. If we go into tech here, we'll see that I only did a minimum amount of military. Uh, obviously, I went f further down here than most because I wanted the income. I've done very little under religious, just enough to get conversion laws and try and improve slave happiness. The big one I went down was oratory tree. I didn't go down the right side other than the loyalty. Instead, I went down the aggressive expansion. More importantly, I targeted the improve relation uh, innovations. And that is key because of the sheer amount of improving of a relation I can do. I can add basically 80 
or 90 happiness. Uh, well, sorry, approval of me in other countries. So even like Rome here, massive, considers me a threat. I can make them almost happy just by improving relations. Um, it's a considerable power. Like these guys right here, I can almost make them a client state um, just by, through improving. And that is basically what I did here. If we look at all these nations, every single nation in Iberia outside of Rome and even outside of it, it's all my subjects. Basically, I was, I think I had 40, 40 settlements, 40 provinces type things. And I was able to raise the legion, hire some mercenaries. And then using the improved relations, I was able to convince all these nations here to become feudatories. Um, thankfully, I'm in Iberia, so a lot of the nation has my culture. I was able to get... I was able to get all of this basically as feudatories. Some of these did not have an acceptable culture for me. Um, they were part of a different culture group, so I made them a client state. I had a bit of issues with client relations. Um, so uh, if I kept going, I'd probably... Um, I'm starting to integrate them as fast as I can. Uh, you want to get the texts that give you diplomatic rep uh, relations. They help a lot. And the stuff that keeps city-states happy. Thankfully, feudatories don't use up slots, so you want more of them. Those that I couldn't feudatory, I made client states. Those I couldn't make client states, I made tribal vassals. Because after a while, every tribal nation will become civilized, thanks to being a tribal vassal. And they will then request to become a client state. I didn't want any tributary nations, but suffice to say, when I declare war, every single one of these subjects raises two to 4,000 troops. And uh, it basically means I've got like 60, 70,000 free troops just from subjects on top of what I can afford. Um, I've been overwhelming both Carthage and Rome through sheer numbers. Uh, if I wanted to, I could ally nations like Avernia without much issue, just improve relations. Uh, I was allied to Rome for a while until I missed a call to arms, but I could work on someone like Egypt, although they're a little too far away. Um, and it's through the power of alliances and subjects you can really fight civilized nations as a tribe. You have to heavily outnumber them. Thankfully, I have actually caught up. I'm at Tech 8 and 9. I've caught up and surpassed both Rome and caught up to Carthage. Although Ro Rome itself had just recently gained some military tech. Basically, I'm on par with most of the successors. Um, although the Seleucids um, and Macedon are particularly high up there. Uh, but as you see, like Armenia and uh, the uh, Maura Empire, I've caught up to them mostly in tech, which means I can fight them on a, uh, at least innovation-based level. Obviously, I don't have the sheer number of troops they have, so I have to supplement it with mercenaries. I've been working my way down here. Obviously, the goal is to get 500 territories as soon as you can to raise legions. The sad fact of the matter is even if I could raise legions, I couldn't raise immense legions, although 18, 13, and 13 are pretty good. So that is roughly the strategy. Get subjects of your own area, try and get as many feudatories as you can, then as many client states as you can, and then pause, try and rack up your tech as fast as you can. The other solution is you can start bribing governors. Um, I've done a bit of governor bribing here. You go to the guy, oh, he's only got 50 loyalty. You make friends, inspire disloyalty, and then you want to do inspired disloyalty right after you make them friends because if their loyalty falls below 40, uh, you can entice them to your side, assuming that their province they govern is below 50 um, loyalty to the nation they're part of, which I found is usually not the hardest thing in the world to get. These aren't here yet. Um, but be aware, once you inspire disloyalty, they'll lose 20 loyalty and the AI will almost immediately try and bribe them to increase that loyalty above 40. Um, and that's how you expand. You can't directly fight a powerhouse like Rome, but you can use allies to do most of the heavy lifting for you and subjects. And you can bribe the heck out of everybody since you should be making money. So the trick I found for tribal nations, improve relations, reduce your guess of expansion. If you can get down to winning land by the spear, this can be absolutely crazy on a tribal nation. Uh, this is my second tribal game as these guys... Uh, Imperial Challenge, basically every province you take immediately flips to you, and since you will have a 
mass subject swarm. Uh, they will occupy lots of little provinces very quickly from you. And you can, even if you can't win the direct battles, you can tend to seize a lot of that land in the war, overwhelm the, the nations just through sheer numbers. Basically be a barbarian horde, even though I'm civilized. It, it's weird, and we'll just go with that. Um, as you can see, the normal laws exist. Um, you need to swap to Royal Guard to get legions, etc. And other stuff. So, hopefully you guys have enjoyed this tribal guide. This is what you can pull off pretty easily. I've got an absolute monstrous amount of subjects. And a good portion of them are loyal, even though they don't say they're loyal. Um, they still join me in the wars. Uh, actually, they're not joining me right now because I haven't raised um, troops and other stuff. But they they tend to be loyal. Um, I think they're unhappy right now. And uh, basically, you swarm over civilized nations. You could try and build up, but the problem is Rome, Carthage, any of the successors, they just tend to gather mass amounts of population. Over here, though, we got Parthia, which started off as a tribal nation. I assume they have reformed since then. Yes, they're an autocratic monarchy like me. As you can see, they've been steadily stealing land from Armenia and the Seleucids. So it's very possible to play a tribe into a successful nation. Um, it just takes time, and until you become a civilized nation, tribes are somewhat boring. Anyway, that's going to be it from me. I do hope you've enjoyed this. I've got a couple more guides planned. Uh, let's see, we've got probably religion and then a couple specific nation guides if you guys have any guides you want to see um, so I'm going to probably do a wonder guide a religion slash deity guide and then maybe some specific country guides if you have any other stuff people would like to see let me know if you enjoyed this please do like subscribe click the bell type thing overall uh, check out my discord if you haven't the link should be working in the description now and I'll see you all in another video thanks for watching Bye for now.